Can you hear by doing this without a mic? Can you do it by can you hear by doing without a mic? Or if we switch off the speaker? Yeah, or turn the speakers really down. Because this mic is only for for the broadcast, right? Because So this is only for broadcast, right? So you can switch off the speakers. Then it won't echo, echo, echo. No, 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 the speakers, I think the output only. I don't know how it's set up. It depends on how you set up the, the hangout. Well, whatever it ha happens, right, you will see here if it is. Yeah, okay. So, that's going. Audio. That's cool, right? Yeah. Audio. Okay, so to all my friends who are watching on Google Hangout, if you can't hear me, yell. <laughs> okay, all, all my friends who are watching on Google Hangout, if you can't hear me, yell. This mic is just for all the people out there on Google Hangout. Yeah, so long as this thing is okay, right? Yeah. This is this yeah, means you are hearing, right? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so that's fine. If you're open. Okay. Are you in touch with the other guys? We should have you on the loudspeakers as well, right? I can be heard here. No problem. So long as people on Google Hangout can hear me. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Because I think in this room, I'm, I'm okay with speaking. Okay. okay, so this is my... Okay? So, you want to you wanna, you wanna start off? Okay, I yeah. don't have your bio with me right now. But, um. Okay, everyone, we are going to start now, and our first speaker is going to be uh, Benjamin Ang, who has a very extensive um, extensive experience in... in sorry. Okay, let me start off again. Okay, so our first speaker is going to be Benjamin Dang, who has a lot of experience in IP, in copywriting, things like that. And he's going to talk about um, what's going to happen if uh, we did exactly what Aaron did um, in the Singapore context, of course. Okay, so let's just hand it over to him now. Thanks a lot, Alexander. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me. And this was really good. I think that was a really good screening, I think it, it really resonated with a lot of us. So really thanks for organizing that. And we could have watched it alone, uh, but we chose to come together. So it does speak something about the community here. Now, what I'm going to talk about is what would happen if we tried to do what Aaron did in Singapore. And instinctively already you're thinking, man, that's not a good idea. <laughs> right? But just for the record, if we we'll ever had the idea that you wanted to change society in Singapore. You know, but why would anybody want to do that since we live in such a perfect utopian society? So, if you had that idea, just want to let you know what um, to watch out for. Because the whole point is that you want to know what to watch out for. Right? There are speed bumps all over. And the idea is not to drive over a speed bump blindfolded. Anyway, driving blindfolded is always a bad idea. But to know that the speed bump is there. So I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, if you can't hear me on the speakers, don't worry. Your ears are still functioning properly. Um, this, this mic is not for fun. It's for the sake of all the people on Google Hangout. And I, as I said earlier, if you're on Google Hangout and you can't hear me, please yell. 
Okay, right. Uh, with my background as a technology lawyer, former IT consultant. Ah, yes, Jin Mei, you could help me do that very important task, which is to click. Thank you. So uh, you can find these slides on my blog. Um, okay, so a bit of a copyright because Jin Mei first asked me to speak on copyright, and then and I went. Actually, it's not really a copyright issue. Copyright is just the background. But I think you want to know what about copyright means is anyway. So then, what about the law against assessing data, which is actually the biggest thing that was facing Aaron Schwartz? So then we'll talk about what can police do? What are police powers? Especially this week, when the US Supreme Court actually ruled that US police cannot take your cell phone and read the data without a warrant. So that is the US Supreme Court's position. But what would it be in Singapore? Stay tuned. OK. And the last one, how could we prevent what happened? OK, so let's go down. So copyright, uh, very briefly, I'll tell you what's one semester's worth of stuff in about two minutes. Uh, the types of works that are protected, obviously music, art, drama, and literary works. And journals, um, the research articles, Although many of us might not really consider that literature, I'm sorry, they're very educational, informative, but even though you might not consider them literature, in the traditional sense, they are protected by copyright. And what copyright prevents you from doing is to make copies. Wow, what a, what a thought. Copyright prevents you from making copies without permission. So therefore, if you're an academic and you've written an article, you own the copyright in that article. OK, so you think. Then we go to the next slide. Who owns the copyright? You may have written an article about your favorite topic, your favorite area of research, and you own the copyright, but you can't get it published in a journal by yourself because you don't own the journal. You don't own the printing presses, and you need somebody to pay for the editor, for the peer review, and getting it published and shipped out to universities all over. And that's where the publisher comes in. They'll pay for that. And in return, you hand over your soul, I mean your copyright, in the article to them. right? And for many years, it's been considered a fair trade because if you're writing articles, you don't have access to all of these resources and you don't have access to the distribution channels. right? Back in the old dark ages. So now. Most of the time, copyright is handed over. And it was alluded to in the film. And this also works in Singapore. So you have journal publishers who own the copyright. So next slide. The question came up. It wasn't really touched in the film, but should the rights holder be the one taking action, or should the police? Because in this case, if you notice, Jay Storr, who's the publisher, actually withdrew. MIT didn't want to have anything to do with it. So could the police take action? Yes, the police have the right to charge people for crimes. may be surprising, but copyright is, when infringed on a very large scale, can be a crime. Normally, it's a civil case. In a civil case, if it were just JSTOR or, or MIT, or in Singapore's context, a university or a publisher doing, you just have to pay damages could be a lot of damages. It's just money, you know? But if the police take action, then you go to jail. And jail is much more serious than paying money. So could the police take action? In Potentially, yes. Although in Singapore context, it rarely happens. Because usually in the Singapore context, it's the rights holder who will be basically getting a private prosecution the permission from the Attorney General, and they will drive. And that's been very effectively used by the BSA and uh, by all the copyright holders in in Singapore. Very, very uh, effective method of enforcing copyright by the right holder doing it. So we don't. Because on the statutes, if you violate in a very large number, and we take, talk about taking about 2 million documents, 2 million documents is usually considered a large number. So you could potentially be 
committing a crime. Right? Okay, so is there a law? But aside from that, let's say in Singapore, the rights holder chose not to take action and the police decided if the rights holder is not going to do it, we won't do it. It could happen. There's another problem, the law against assessing data without authority. And we have a computer misuse and cyber security. This computer misuse and cyber security act is very similar in ways to the to the intention of the uh, computer fraud and abuse act which was talked about. And what it does is that it criminalizes certain actions. The most important one is section unauthorized access. And you want to know what's the meaning of unauthorized? It's defined in section 2. Access is if you alter or erase, copy or move. Oops, I see that the thing which I've put noted as C will definitely be what happened here. If you went in and you made copies, you brought a hard drive, a laptop, and you copied data, that would be access. Okay? Even if you cause it to be output on a display, that's access. Right? All these are either or. You don't have to do all. If you use it, it's considered access. So clearly, there would be access. Now, the thing is that access alone is not a crime. Otherwise, all of us would be arrested immediately. We do this every day. The what is a crime is unauthorized access, which is the next slide. Unauthorized is if you are not yourself entitled to control access of the kind in question. And so, do you normally have access to this? Do you normally have authority to access this? Or you don't have access of the kind in question. So if you had an account, imagine now, you have an account to a publisher and you have access to articles. Do you normally have access to 2 million downloads? That's where the gray area is going to be. It's meant to catch situations like the next slide, where you ask yourself, can a system administrator in a company read, com read employees' emails? And the answer is yes and no. Because if the company authorizes the system administrator, yes, he can. Yes. What if the? Privileges. Authority. You mean the authority? If you are the employee or you are the system admin? Yeah, if you are the well, all, all sys admin are usually employees, unless they're contractors. So if you're the sys admin, then if you're authorized by, and we look back, what's the meaning of unauthorized? You're yeah, not entitled to control access of the kind, which would be usually the employer owns the server, then under Singapore law, the employer will be able to authorize the sysadmin to read all the email. No. Yeah, but the thing is that the sysadmin can. The sysadmin has the right. Yeah, the sysadmin has the right. Yes. So it's okay. If you are a sysadmin, do you have the right to, if, to read the email of the hot new secretary because you want to find out where she's going and you want to stalk her? <laughs> okay, do you have the right not to incriminate yourself when you answer this question? <laughs> so that becomes the question mark, right? Okay, what is your purpose? Okay, so that, see, it's not a simple answer in the law. And so there will be issues. Okay, so next one is, there's a case where, this actual case, Song Yik Piao, he got people to, he met people in chat rooms and said, could you please give me your password? I think I'm simplifying it a bit. So he then uses 
her password to chat with her friends online and to make indecent proposals. And he was arrested for unauthorized access and convicted. He was. Yeah, he was. It's, huh? it's a fact. I, I'm, just saying it's a, I'm just saying it's a fact. I'm not, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. I'm saying it's a fact. So the next one, Muhammad Nazaihan's case, where he actually got in, open, he basically got into somebody else's um, server, opened, used an open port to I, get to IRC. He also installed a backdoor on SCV, now known as Starhub's FTP server, and used FTP so that the FTP server so he could access the high-speed network without paying. He also was charged with unauthorized access and also convicted. So this law has been used and has been used and it's secured conviction. Okay, so what was the? Um, ah, next one. Typical sentences. First time up to 10K, prison three years. Second time up to 20K, prison five years. Yes, uh, I off the top of my head, it's probably something a little less than that, but not far less. Yeah, under the criminal law. Uh, Singapore dollars. Exchange rate now is one point. Uh, I, I don't know, right? But um, so we go back. The thing is that in Muhammad Nohazahan's case, I believe each of these was a separate offense. So you can be added up. So we go back to this offense. First time could have been potentially. If you want the exact numbers, we can chat afterwards because I'll go and check my actual records. But you can you can chalk up a few offenses in and if it's a protected computer, which is basically a government controlled computer or a financial services computer or a hospital computer, the fine goes up to hundred K, prison goes up to twenty years. If you break into two hospital computers or you break into one hospital, one government, you can go up to twenty plus twenty. You go into one bank, one hospital, one government, twenty plus twenty plus twenty. See what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Security, defense. Um, next. Um, police, communication infrastructure, banks, public services. Yeah. The actual sentencing will depend at the time on many circumstances. Yeah, many circumstances. The the pure fact alone of getting access into a computer basically gets you in the door. Yeah. Whether whether you are this is not a door that you want to get into. It's the courtroom <laughs> door. It will get you into court. After that, whether you're sentenced we haven't decided whether you will be found guilty yet, even. Yeah. But um, if you get sentenced, they will depend on many factors. You have to show your intention. What is it? What happened? Did you accidentally go in? Were you in there at a white hat? Uh, reasons you were actually helping them to discover uh, security flaws. Uh, so those are the things which uh, will come into play when you talk about sentencing. Uh, but the max is there. That's the potential. Um, white hat hacker cases, to my, based on the research I have, un, if they are not prosecuted, you don't get reported. The law only reports conviction cases, the, or not cases which are dropped. Because if there's no, if they are dropped, then you don't go to court. So there's nothing to report. Good questions. What can police do when investigating a case? Well, just to let you know, under the criminal procedure code, they can search and seize your computer. I should have added in one more thing. I didn't realize that they had spoken to Quinn Norton as well. They can speak to your relatives, your family. If you are living um, with somebody else, they can go and search not just your room, but the other rooms. They can seize the computer. They can break encryption. They can demand passwords or demand decryption. Failure to help 
is obstruction. Obstruction can lead to prison. This is very, this is really a downer, right? This, you can even be required to provide um, real-time information. Okay? So this is all specified in the Criminal Procedure Code. Like I said, I'm not saying that any of this is right or wrong. I'm saying that that's the case. It's there. Okay, so here's the problem. And in a criminal, if a criminal case happens, the fact is that it is not the prosecution's job to take care of the welfare of the accused. That's just the way the system is. In a society, the, in a prosecution, the prosecutor's job is to get the conviction if they believe that the person should be convicted. Yeah, sorry. Under, with, upon an arrest. Um, if there, thanks to the new amendments for cybersecurity, if the minister is convinced that there is a threat to national security, he can then order any person to assist in investigation, which then says that part of the powers may include these powers. And this was just passed last year or the year before, and nobody noticed. Right? And we all went to black out our websites for SOPA. And this happened in our own backyard. Okay? So, which relates to the fact that the prosecution is not going to look after any of us if we are arrested, it's not their job. The investigators are not going to look after our welfare if any of us are arrested. That's not their job. The only people who can look after us, any of us, is us. And so, the sad thing is that some of the, the people who interviewed were saying, yeah, they felt really angry and sad that they, hadn't, they didn't know. There's a legal aid bureau for people who don't have the resources to pay for lawyers. There's legal aid. There are also lawyers who will take on the case pro bono, which is for the good or without pay. The real difficulty is that the world out there, and we are in the bubble, the world outside our bubble does not know, does not understand what the Aaron Sword case is about. A couple of people who saw my post that I was coming to this talk asked me, so what's the Aaron Sword case about? And I just told it offhand and they said, oh yeah, he's guilty, but he should have been arrested. That's the public view. Now if you know anybody outside the bubble, try telling them the Aaron Sword story and see what their reaction is. They won't say, oh that's terrible, he was victimized. No, they'll say, Wow, good that the police caught him. That's what the world out there thinks because they don't understand. And only we can help to basically educate and to help support any of us who is ever in a situation like that. The Samaritans, the such community for people who are in depression. If we can just also just look up from our screens once in a while and see if the person whom it's sad. So many people idolized him. Nobody knew that he was in pain. That they could have helped. Can't blame them. I mean, you only know these things in hindsight. But hopefully if we can reach out, and it's great that there's a community here, if anybody is in trouble, to reach out and help. So if it happens to you or somebody you know, I can only say, please, get help. Legal help. Emotional support. Because if you saw all the stuff, the law in Singapore, could it happen to you? 
Hell yeah. Okay. So I say the good thing is that thank goodness for the folks here who are put stuff like this together. I really thank Alexander and Jimmy. This is really good because it shows that at least you care enough to be here and hopefully you care enough to help. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Benjamin. Um, next speaker will be Vikram. Yeah, and he's been introduced to me actually as uh, Singapore's own internet's own boy, or <laughs> whatever that's worth. <laughs> okay, so I'll just hand this over to him. Um, I didn't do slides, but I stuck at memory, so I'm going to read some materials off my screen. Can I just is that okay? Is that okay? Hello, Internet. Hello, world. I can actually say hello, world and address the world. Isn't that cool? Ever done that? Um, so, uh, you know, like, what's your name again? Was it Ben? I just spoke. Ben? Okay. So, uh, Ben was just talking about uh, what copyright allows. Um, and I think the more important question is the extent to which copyright serves its intended purpose. Copyright developed separately in America and the United Kingdom um, through a shared goal to promote useful scientists, to get the people who, you know, were musicians and the authors to continue making books and publishing scores. And they did this by conferring a set of rights to them. Precisely, they said they were the only people who could publish them unless they passed those rights on to other people. When technology developed to a point at which compositions could be recorded, right, and we could distribute music directly, composers and music publishers imagine their continued distribution, right, just like printing things off rather than selling compositions would destroy innovation in music, right? So uh, rather than music rather than musicians being paid for their compositions, right? And these being, oh, I get a microphone? That's awesome. Hello, world. OK, I did it properly that time. Right, OK, so um, they figured, right, because um, instead of selling printed music, right, they were selling recordings of these music, that this would quench innovation in the development of music, right? Um, and so they called for a ban, right? They said to their legislators, OK, so we're artists, right? And copyright is designed in such a way to you know, promote artistic pursuit. And we're not getting any monies, money from you know, publishing your little vinyl records, right? Or piano prints or whatever. And uh, instead, the legislature proposed an alternative. They said, OK, so every time you print a record, you have to pay a fixed fee, right? to the musicians. So, you know, for one, they get incentivized to continue doing good work. And on the other hand, you know, uh, by virtue of the new medium, artists get to get their work out to more and more people, which sort of suits their purposes. The more recent ability for individuals rather than corporations to reproduce and distribute work at no cost hasn't been met with similar legislation, you know, even though it brings more reach to artists. You know, instead, you've got like nations crippling their economies through trade agreements, defending the maintenance of mechanisms that are based on shitty economics that are inapplicable to their subject and are harmful to free expression. But copyright's a hard debate, and you know, we've gone over this; it's irrelevant. So I'm going to talk a bit more about Aaron instead and what Aaron did. So Aaron most uh, drastically diverged from your archetype hacker in his commitment to ethics. 
So, you know, we have our portrait of J. Random Hacker, who learns to read at three, spends her childhood in front of her computer, at some point looks up from her CRT display, and everything is covered in cascading green digits. Maybe she waits so long as to graduate from college, but not soon after, she's traded her graduation gowns for a robe and wizard hat and operated down to the valley to convince her friends to buy more, to see more ads. Aaron did all that, um, approximately. Aaron does all that, he hits a jackpot, and then he breaks the script. He decided, I don't want this. I want to use my magical powers for good. And you know, he tries, he wins some. One of the functions of that film was to motivate the hackers in this room, guys like Thomas and Saini and Chinmay over there, to do the same, right? To abandon your well-paying job and big house and large automobile, to leverage your technical competence for the greater humanity. <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> in um, the unlikely case it provided you momentum toward doing so, I feel compelled to argue that this is a terrible idea. <laughs> or more precisely, to communicate, I don't know how an act to enact change reliably or to change legislation reliably. And any way I can imagine you trying leads to you getting hurt a lot. Let's say you're rightly dissatisfied with intellectual property law. You're unhappy living in a society in which it holds, right? And in WTA member states, there's an international baseline for this. And if you can convince your policymakers to lobby for an amendment, you actually have the start of global change. But how do we do that? One way is through resistance, through civil disobedience. This is when you say, I think this law is unjust and unfair, and so I'm not going to follow it anymore. This is what I think Aaron was doing in that network closet. I think this is fundamentally effective, or at least it's in ineffective when you're the weakest of the involved parties. Throughout history, property disputes have always been solved through military means. So you say, give me your wallet. And this guy says, no. And then this guy beats this guy with a club, and he takes his wallet, right? Or if not that, it's deference based on assumed military capability. Give me your wallet. No. Give me your wallet, or I'll hit you with this club. OK, have my wallet. The eventual codification of law doesn't provide exception to this, though it reduces the number of disputes by way of reducing uncertainty. There's general consensus that state has the most military power and will reliably employ it against any who violate its rules. Give me your wallet. No. Give me your wallet or I'll hit you with this club. If you hit me with this club, the law will put you away for 30 years. OK, you can keep your wallet. When Aaron writes, or at least signs his name to, the Guerrilla Act Open Access Manifesto, and declares, there is no justice in following unjust laws. We need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks and start to act on it. What he's saying is, individually, I think we're more powerful than the state. Law is nothing without power, and so I'll make my own. The resulting violence is predictable. If the state doesn't respond with hurt, it's recognized as selectively enforcing its own property rights. And the resulting uncertainty about what it'll allow just redirects us to our earlier condition of perpetual violence. The same is true of strikes, though I don't know how they're applicable here. And at least in Singapore, it's true of public demonstrations without a permit. But hey, you argue, if we're trying to change international law, why not stage our protests in other cities? You could. But I have a deeper criticism. Protests aren't effective because protests don't do anything. You aren't inconveniencing your target. The most useful mo model of protests I've read treats them as a degenerate remnant of strikes. Strikes actually interfere with the operations of your target. And if they don't resolve that conflict, admittedly, not necessarily through concession to your terms, they lose something. By contrast, there's no cost to ignoring protesters. You aren't getting in anyone's way. You might be able to communicate your views to your representatives, but in a democracy where there are n parties, and none of the parties will work for what you want, your vote will still be based on other details. I suppose migration form is an alternative. So you say, OK, I dislike this policy, and so I'm going to leave for a society in which 
the law doesn't apply. Rather than changing policy, you disappear it. But, I mentioned but as I mentioned before, the baseline for intellectual property rights are, are set by international agreements, right? And off the top of my head, there is no state outside of the WTO which is practically habitable. Where to go? I like the idea of seasteading, where we put out these networks of retrofitted vessels. And on the vessels, right, you, they set their own laws, right? Because there's this cool thing where, like, on the law, you don't submit to any sovereignty, right, uh, that you don't choose to, right? Um, we have this cheap prototyping environment policy, and there's no real cost for people to migrate from one ship to another, right? You live wherever the policy treats you best, right? And so we have all of these like little startup nations optimizing for customer service, right, in their policy. Because the more people they get, right, the higher their GDP. And in that system, there is a actual incentive to change based on express preferences. But we don't have that. Um, hackers in the audience, this would be cool to work on, by the way, um, instead of this thing. Um, I'm not saying that intellectual property reform isn't a worthy cause. Copyright law, as it stands, doesn't solve any of its intended goals. It's an archaic monolith of law maintained by entertainment giants to avoid finding a working business model. But I'm not sure how any citizen anywhere would go about enacting that reform. I don't know how to fix anything. Maybe work out a mechanism before you try. Maybe research history and found out, find out how the sausages got made before. I don't know nearly enough history, and I think maybe woman suffrage would be a place to start. I should add that I think this argument only holds for um, existing legislation. When you have new legislation, when you have people trying to you know, submit legislation, you have two things. In the case in which you're powerful, you can enter that discussion. And in the case in which you aren't, right, you have people, and people are vulnerable to expression of preferences in ways that organizations aren't. Sofer and PIFA killed over when thousands of state representatives got emails about why they couldn't access Wikipedia or why they couldn't access Craigslist or Reddit. At a personal level, that was enough incentive to start taking seriously, you know, to, to seriously start investigating concerns, to think they might not be in the right. And I think you're likely to have far more luck in that case. Uh, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thanks, Vikram. Um, OK, so the next speaker is Elena Saita. But uh, hang on a moment, let me. Can you hear us? Yeah, hear I can hear you guys. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Great. Cool. Hang on, we're trying to get you up on the screen. Yeah, no worries. Can video I can actually see. Okay, so now you are up on the screen. Um, I'll just introduce you briefly. According to Ella's short bio, she is a hacker, designer, artist, writer, and barbarian. Uh, she also personally knew Aaron, and um, I'll just hand it over to her right now. Okay, over to you, Ella. Hi. So. I guess I have a kind of a complex relationship with this story. I did know Aaron, although not well, but um, 
Quinn, his partner for a long time, who you've now seen in the video, um, is a very dear friend of mine who I've known for ages. And I don't know. I don't have a lot to say about Aaron as a person. I didn't know him well enough to really speak on of him in that way. Um, but I do have a lot to say about that story. I count Aaron as war dead. I count Aaron as war dead along with a lot of other, far too many other folks I know. He's not the first, he's not the last. Um, Ilya, Len, there, there's a long list of names. There's a longer list of almost names. And this is what happens when we see structural conflicts over what power means, when we see conflicts with heavily empowered forces that are willing to discard people's lives cheaply. Um, the, number of, uh, the number of people who've been discarded like this is far too long and it's just going to keep growing for some time. But we're in structural conflict with a suicidal system. The state as it stands and the state corporate power structures as they stand are literally killing themselves and are taking us with them. The, it's not just copyright, although copyright is one aspect, it's one tiny little aspect that is strangling creativity, that is moving the money from places where it should be going to artists, to people who are actually doing work, and moving it into, into you know, corporate third parties that have nothing to do with this business. Um, but that's really not nearly the worst of it. We're building societies that are fundamentally kind of anti-human, that, that don't particularly um, construct themselves to give us room to live. Um, we're building societies that are fundamentally short-sighted, that are not dealing with basic realities like climate change. And they're not doing that because the people who control those societies want to hang on to the money and the power and the privilege that they have now. And unless that system changes, it will take all of us with it. Aaron knew this. Aaron was fighting that fight. Aaron believed that he could fight that fight in a deeply meaningful way. And he was right. Um, you know, for all that I dearly wish he'd had another 50 years to fight and to see the, the value of his labor. He didn't, but this is what happens when you fight. Sometimes you lose, and sometimes you don't lose. We're in a period of a shift in power structures that is happening along with the suicidality of this infrastructure. Um, there's a wonderful RAND paper, and that's not a sentence I normally say, but there's a wonderful paper from the RAND Corporation on tribes, institutions, markets, and networks. And it's talking about the structural change that's happening as networks come of age as a new structure, not a technical structure, but as a new structure for the organizing of people into groups. You know, tribes, institutions, markets, and networks are all, are all ways that we um, take some kind of collective action. And each time a new one of these has shown up, the fundamental structures of all of the previous ones have changed. What power means has changed. When what power means changes, we have an opportunity to redefine the impact of that power. We have an opportunity to change whether we live in liberatory or aliberatory societies. The notion of networks as a separate space, as a liberated space, is one that is outdated. Um, it seemed like it made a lot of sense in the 90s, and then we realized that networks weren't a separate technological space. They were actually just us, and our lives, and our everyday. Um, we don't think of, for example, we don't think of institutions as being technologically enabled power structures because we don't see the technology, right? Double entry bookkeeping, filing systems, alphabetization, 
you know, printed forms. We don't think of these as technology, but of course they are, right? They're, they're technology that's just been refined over so long it's become completely invisible. Now, in an age of network power structures, we'll eventually see the same thing. And that notion of networks as a separate liberatory space dropping away is part of that normalization of that technology. And what it's brought with us is it's brought a growing conflict and a growing understanding that we can't differentiate between the space that we live online where we feel like we have much for more freedom and the Westphalian space where the networks are actually built. And we've built a lot of norms on networks over the past 40 years, which turn out that maybe they don't, you know, maybe they're in conflict with some of those nation states and some of those corporations. But that doesn't mean that we have to stick with that conflict and just give up. You know, it, we, can, we can fight back and we can fight back effectively. It's a long process of change. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not necessarily even going to happen in our lifetimes entirely. As Quinn says, this isn't a sprint, and it's not even a marathon. It's a relay race. Aaron believed in change from the inside in a lot of ways. You know, while he did do things like the JSTOR download that were very much working outside the system, he also spent a lot of time and a lot of effort fighting to change from the inside, fighting to force institutions to actually take seriously the duties that they've claimed they want to uphold, to actually take seriously the mechanisms that they put in place which are supposed to provide for some degree of um, equality, some degree of justice. I don't necessarily believe in the viability of those mechanisms. In some cases I do, and when I see an opportunity to change things from, within, from inside the system, I will definitely take that opportunity. But overall, I really don't. Um, these are different strategies. These are different ways of seeing systems. This isn't a fundamental difference. But I think that... So we, we've now seen an example. We've now had a, an example held up to us of what our duty looks like as human beings not as hackers, not as anything else, as human beings. Each and every one of us has a duty to fight for the world that we want to live in, to fight for our dreams. Over the past, I don't know, 50 years, 70 years, over modernity, basically, um, certainly, I would say, throughout rich countries, and often in, in a lot of the rest of the world, we've forgotten how to dream. We've forgotten how to have political dreams. The last big liberatory dream that the world had was communism, and that was as aggressively captured as many other things were. And now we seem to be stuck in some sort of thing where the only thing we can dream is the, the aggressive continuation of capitalism. Capitalism will lead us to a more liberatory future. Of course it won't. Um, we need new visions for how we want to live. We need new structures for how we understand how we work together. And coming up with those dreams is a very big part of continuing that fight of building a future that we actually want to live in. There's a, there's a quote that you never want to see laws or sausages getting made. And it turns out the only thing worse than those is watching saints get made. Um, may you never have the misfortune of being too close to a saint getting made. But you've got a saint now. And by God, you better get out of your chairs after this and fight in his name. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Um, okay, so now we're going to have the Q&A, 20 minutes as well. Um, maybe our other two speakers would like to come up here. Okay, any questions from the floor?
Hi. Okay. So not quite a question. That's maybe not a good idea. Uh, uh, but but a comment, or I guess a question. What you think about this? So so three things. One, uh, to Vikram said that protests don't really do anything. But I grew up in Australia in a very corrupt government in the 80s, and we protested. We marched. We got beaten by police. We got arrested, and the government changed. And I think that was very much a part of it. So it's true that protests come at some personal cost, but I don't think that uh, they should necessarily be ruled out. And it's possible that I'm not advocating um, anyone to do this in Singapore, because um, different circumstances are, of course, different for different things. And I wouldn't do it in a country that isn't my own, I guess. You have your own um, places where you think you should fight. But I think um, protests are not necessarily a dead end, was one comment. The second was on the sort of slightly depressing um, tone of, uh, uh, I guess, sorry, I can't pronounce your name properly, the last speaker, um, who, who, who said you know, that things are getting much worse. And I think things are far from perfect. But again, in my lifetime in Australia, black people went from being non-citizens to citizens. Um, women got the vote in the last 100 years. I think that now we're fighting about freedom to access um, intellectual property is a happy thing. It's better than fighting for um, the right for women to vote, for example. We've actually made some progress. And the final thing was one of the ways we can change. So I'm an academic. I write papers. And in our subfield of computational linguistics, we opened up all our journals. So we basically took control from the publishers, and we said, we, we will release it. And partly it's because no one reads our journals anyway, so um, <laughs> it's not as if they were losing a lot of money or anything. But it was for any paper oh. it's kind of what it's OK, and it was there for you to read, legally there for you to read, because we made this fight. We said it makes sense to release things, and we will release things. So without changing the legislation, you can also make, I think, useful changes. Although changing legislation would also be a fantastic thing. So I'd like to respond um, briefly. Um, I agree that the, uh, the relationship, that, that things have gotten better in some ways. Um, but, and I, I don't know the situation in Singapore, although, um, and excuse me for pronouncing the name incorrectly, I did see the case of Roy Nguyen Giling uh, recently that indicates that maybe there are still some complexities going on. Um, that said, you know, if I look at America and I look at Europe, which I know much better, you know, in the US we've gone from a political system that was merely corrupt in a lot of ways 150 years ago to a political system now where it is no longer, um, we have no more illegal bribery of politicians in America. It's wonderful. Uh, we've legalized all of the bribery. Um, so we fixed that problem. Um, and there are structural issues which run incredibly deep of state capture here. Um, the, the previous speaker to me mentioned looking at the women's suffrage movements as an example for, for how that fight happened. You know what the women's suffrage movement did? They got out in the streets and they fought. And I don't mean they fought as in they marched with placards. They did that too. I mean they broke windows. They got arrested. They got murdered by the police in numbers. And that was what it took. It took an actual fight. It took inconveniencing those in power to a degree that not changing became impossible. That is what it takes. Now, I don't necessarily think that street protest is the best option. I do not, certainly do not know enough about the Singaporean context to make any comment on, uh, on what makes sense there. But I also don't think that this notion that we can simply, for example, petition the rich to share their money 
with other people and that if we send them a really nice letter, if we send them a nice enough letter, they'll just kind of hand over their money to the poor? No, this is not how history works. Um, I believe that as we are in a time of systemic change and as we are dealing with many systems that have different ways of leverage, there are places where we can provoke that leverage, but we will need to do that. Cool. Uh, okay, so thing. Uh, most of what I was trying to uh, communicate there was I was trying to be like a, a gadfly and like fight you all, um, because um, I don't understand how these mechanisms work. Um, and as successful as like fighting might be, right, and as successful as protesting might be, I don't really get something. And I don't really feel comfortable about something unless I get the system system involves and I can predict it to an extent at which if I make some fixed change, I have an outcome which I can anticipate in advance. And um, OK, so thing, right? So um, when you say, OK, so um, you fight a person, right? And, and, and you inconvenience them to an extent that they have to make a decision. I don't really understand how that works at a mechanical level. And it seems, in particular, incompatible with full knowledge of the military capacity of you know, the state and government. And maybe someone can explain that to me, because I'm really confused. He handed it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but if we look at what, he, um, yeah. for example, Aaron Swartz was doing. Oh, okay. So let's see what he did very successfully. And what he did very successfully um, was spearhead the killing of SOPA. And it's not easy to kill a bill that's going to be passed into law. right? There's so much momentum, there's so much money going to it, that so much political will to get something passed into law, it's really hard to kill. But he did it, and if we watch the movie and we take what is there as on face value, he didn't do it by street protest per se. He was doing it through a very scientific method of getting the voters to speak to their representatives and also the big money corporations to show their dissatisfaction to the political representatives. At this point, it gets boring because it's politics. But there was a systemic way in which he did it. And so understanding the lawmaking process, at least I can talk about that, although don't politics. If anybody here is a political science person, please raise your hand, save us. Um, he basically was able to hack the political system and able to manipulate how the result came out. So it would have been wonderful if he had been alive to be able to do that for so many other laws that could have been changed in a very similar way. I mean, from that, I think the great thing is that it was done in the open and all of us saw how it was done. And now we have to find a way how we can do that in Singapore. Because we know that if we go outside the presidential palace, Istana, and we carry placards, basically we get arrested. Right? That has already been shown. So that, And then after you get arrested, nobody really does much. So, But what he did seemed to be very effective. So is there something that we can learn from that? And I'm not a person who can advise on that, so I can't help you, man. But if there's anyone who understands politics and technology as well, we need more people like that to, to help. One of the things I'd say is that there is, no, um, there is no way of predicting outcomes. We have to go into this knowing that we have no idea exactly what the outcomes of our actions will be, and that's fine. We have to learn to live with structural uncertainty um, and actually, one of the reasons that I, I think that this is good, um, that there is uncertainty, that it's good that we don't necessarily know exactly how things are going to come out, is that we, it turns out, are much better at living with uncertainty. Individual humans and networks of humans are much better at living with uncertainty than institutions and markets are, than the structures that we see oppressing us in the world. And that is an advantage that we can can very much use to our benefit.
No, I don't think it's on. OK, all right. Um, hi, uh, I'm Cedric. I'm a technologist. I assume that most of the audience here are technologists. And we've spent most of this session um, talking about the technicalities of Aaron's case. Uh, but the big thing for me uh, when, when watching Aaron, when following Aaron's life, was that, could you, oh, you can't hear. All right, OK. Um, the big thing for me, so we've, we have, I suspect that most of us here are technologists. Am I right? Yeah? Um, and the, we've spent most of tonight talking about uh, the technicalities of Aaron's case, uh, what happened, um, what his life story was. I think uh, the uh, because he showed that uh, people the audio is dying. If you could hold it up a bit closer, sorry. Oh, sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, Aaron was a beacon of hope for many people uh, because he showed that with the right amount of leverage and with the will to believe that you can change things, you can actually change things. Now I know that as technologists, we often like live in our little startup bubbles of privilege where we can work everywhere in the world. And we think that you know, and, and you know, we, we think that we, we just build the solutions to the problems, and someone somewhere will apply those prop solutions to to solve world problems. Um, but Aaron was very inspirational for me because he showed that it's not enough to just build solutions. You have to go on and actually look for ways to apply them to the world. Uh, I think I would like um, if if we remember uh, that a lot of his life story was just the will to believe that you can change things and that you have a responsibility to change things instead of just being a technologist and like living in your little privilege bubble, uh, thinking that you would change the world by sitting down and writing code. Because some problems in the world are not uh, likable. I mean, you can't solve them with code or with, through the cloud. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say. I have a comment on that, actually. OK, so um, as an externally um, declared Aaron Swa fanboy, um, I should mention um, he had about affecting change without quitting your job. Um, in the year or so uh, before we lost him, um, Aaron Swartz was uh, active on a community web blog um, called Less Wrong. And uh, one of the things he wrote about, and one of the things there, is optimal philanthropy. And the goal there is saying, OK, so I have like a shit ton of cash, right? Or maybe I did, but then I was in a lawsuit, and whatever, right? Um, and I want to give this away in a way that does the most good. And there's this organization which says, OK, so I'm going to investigate these thousands of charities, and I'm going to take maybe two, you know? that do, do the most good, that most effectively, in a utilitarian sense, do well in human lives. And I'm going to count these out. And in the case in which you know, you're comfortable traveling all over the world, and you like working in technology directly, rather than leveraging that in other areas, and you're happy people using your stuff, there is an opportunity for you to affect positive change without really changing your lifestyle. And I think that's kind of cool. I want to um, just make a, a quick comment on, on what code can do. When, uh, if we look at something like Skype, Skype has had an amazing impact on the world. Um, Skype has meant that we now see international remittances, people sending money back to their families at home, are, are gone from being l well under half of what international foreign aid was to now being something like eight times. 
and you can trace that directly along line with communications get across nations getting cheap. And so this is a really interesting example of where having a uh, having a structural shift that's purely technology driven has completely has has had massive political ramifications. So I don't think it's true. Like you know, work in a startup, write code, do that, absolutely do that. I'm not saying that you have to you know go be a a protester in the street because that is not necessarily the best way to change systems that that affect us, but understand the world that you want to live in, have a dream of what that world looks like, and then figure out how to go build that world. Don't just build the things that are easy, you know, and that are going to make you money, that are going to let you IPO, are going to let you do whatever. Build things that actually actively build the world you want to see, whatever they are. Any more from the floor? Any comments? No? OK. Um, I guess then, if there are no more questions, we'll just end the session here. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very rousing talk at the end, Ella. And also for to Vikram and <coughs> Benjamin for the very informative talks that you gave and the good questions from the floor. Um, I think. I would like to say just one thing, and that is, yeah, you, you you really I think it's been echoed here as well that you, you can't change anything by sitting alone. Everything has to be done by a diversity of people, and that's why I thought that you know even though you could sit at home and watch the film by yourself, it would be great if you guys met up, talked, and see what came of it. Um, there are a lot of things that we probably need to talk about that we don't talk about, especially in Singapore. For example, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. No one talks about that. Um, so, you know, if you want to discuss those matters, please come up, uh, connect with people. So, you know, even if you can't see a way to start, just by talking, something might happen, right? That, that's actually how this thing came about. We were like, um, someone should screen this thing. Then all of a sudden, over 24 hours, we got the thing together. Of course, we had to shift the space, but we did. We actually organized this in under 24 hours, which was kind of shocking. Um, and that's thanks very much also to Robert, who is uh, where's he gone? Okay, there he is, right there. And Jeremy, right here for the NBA. NBC. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, if you want to change things, you you know, like Aaron, or maybe not like Aaron, you have to be prepared for what might come. But we should be optimistic about that. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, if you'd like to speak with the speakers, uh, please come up, talk to them, while the rest of us pack up. Thank you.